Well, this is for when you are done with the first assignment. I'm going to give you a quick intro to the next one. Uh, the most important concept we are going to uh, introduce in the next assignment is the concept of force. Uh, intuitively, you know what a force is. It's something like your weight, something that pushes or pulls. Um, and the most important equation we're going to use is Newton's second law, uh, which is stated like this. Uh, the net force, or the sum of all the forces on one body, is equal to the mass of that body times the acceleration of that body. Um, we take this something like an axiom. Uh, you'll notice here, I've written little arrows over the letters because uh, they are vectors. Uh, this tells you that the x components add up to mass times the x component of acceleration and also that the y components of the force add up to the y components of the acceleration. Rather than write two equations, one for x, one for y, that are almost identical, I write the letter f with the arrow hat on top of it. That tells me there's an x and a y component to the force and a z component for problems that are dimensional. So that's a brief uh, digression on the notation. Uh, but once we start accepting this as the law of force, we start discovering a lot of forces. Uh, might not be the ones that first occurred to your head, uh, but if we do accept that this is a truth, then they have to exist, and that's the logic of it. Uh, so the most obvious one is weight. We've already learned that a body under the influence of its weight alone, meaning it's in free fall and nothing else is touching the body or holding it back, the body will be in free fall and it will have an acceleration of precisely g, or 9.81 meters per second squared, if it's on the surface of the Earth. So, if there's one force in this sum, let's call it F1, and we don't have the other uh, terms in the sum because there's only one force on the freely falling body that's only its weight, then necessarily F will have to have a magnitude of mg, the mass of the body, times the acceleration of the body, in order for that equation to work out and get the observed result that A is 9.81 meters per second squared. So that's why when you're asked for the weight of a body, the answer is always the mass of the body times the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth, the constant 9.81 meters per second squared. Okay, now we'll add one more force to the problem. We'll take something like a table. I'm going to use the surface of the book for a table, and we'll put an object. I'll use this bottle cap for the object. It'll be resting on the table, like that. Now, the bottle cap's weight does not disappear while it is at rest on the table. Because it is at rest, we reason that its initial velocity is zero and its final velocity is zero. That's what at rest means. Now, its acceleration is the difference between its final and initial velocity divided by the elapsed time, and since that's zero minus zero, its acceleration is zero. So that means if we assume that the weight of the bottle cap does not simply vanish just because it is resting on a tabletop, and of course that's a reasonable assumption, then we must deduce that there is a second force acting on the bottle cap, equal and opposite to the bottle cap's weight. So if there is a force in the down direction of mg for the bottle cap, but its acceleration is zero, there must be another force, equal magnitude opposite direction, so that the sum of the forces, F1 plus F2, adds up to zero, to get the zero acceleration that is required there. That force is called the contact force. We just talked through weight. Weight is easy. Then the contact force is the other force acting on the bottle cap in this little demonstration. The bottle cap not accelerating even though it has weight. The contact force is supplied by the contact of the bottle cap with the surface of the table. That provides an equal and opposite force which balances out the bottle cap's weight. Okay? Now, to make the problem one step more complicated, I will tilt the book. This is now called an inclined plane, and you can see that the bottle cap starts to slide. Like that. Okay. Now, there are three forces in this problem. Is it safe for me? No. The first one is the normal force, which we already discussed, and the weight. That's number two. The third is the force that we call friction. 
and these forces are all in different directions. Okay, the weight, let me hold the bottle cap without the table, the weight is down. The contact force is the sum of what we call the normal force and the friction force. The normal force is called normal, not because it's not weird. The opposite of normal is not weird. Normal means perpendicular to a surface. So the, the normal force points in this direction on the bottle cap. Okay, it has a weight down and a normal force in this direction. The normal force introduces, in this case, an unbalanced component in the x direction. If the cap were at rest, there would need to be a third force which introduces another component in the x direction. That force is friction. Friction is always parallel to a surface. So the direction of friction on the bottle cap is like that. If the bottle cap were at rest, those three forces would add to zero. It's a law of friction that the force, the magnitude of friction cannot be greater than a certain coefficient, which is called the coefficient of friction, times the magnitude of the normal. You see that stated as F is equal to mu times N, where mu is some constant that depends on the materials of the two surfaces. When the bottle cap is sliding, There, the bottle cap was now sliding, and that was because I tilted the book so much that the force of friction that would be required to hold the bottle cap stationary could not be produced because the normal force was too weak. When the normal force gets weaker the further you tilt the book up toward vertical. At vertical, the normal force will be zero. At horizontal, the normal force will be equal to the full weight of the bottle cap, and in between, the normal force is less in between them. So as you decrease the normal force of friction, it has to decrease proportionally until eventually it can't hold the bottle cap anymore and the bottle cap slides. The last force that I'll introduce in this uh, short discussion is the spring force. Uh, very many objects are compressible or expandable. If it's a approximately solid body and you compress it, it wants to expand back to its original size. Same if you expand it, it wants to return to its original size by shrinking. An object that does that in one dimension is called a spring. That's the definition of a spring for our class, and the force exerted by a spring is equal to a constant called k, the spring constant, times the distance by which you've either expanded or compressed it. When the spring is actually a string or a rope, that force is now called tension, the rope doesn't expand very much because it is stiff, so we don't actually calculate the uh, compression or expansion of the rope. We assume it's zero, but we assume that because it is stretched, it applies some force in the backward direction, and that is called the tension of the rope. You usually know what the tension of a rope is because the body attached to the rope is at rest, and you know the rest of the force is acting on that body, so the tension is whatever one must be left over to make the sum of the forces equal to zero. That's my short introduction to the second homework assignment, and uh, good luck on that. And there will be more concepts on that assignment. I hope we will bring them out in the discussion forums.